They were photographs right. of them, and then there was the, the you know, they supposedly yeah. built that subject. Yeah. 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 yeah, there are photographs of them. There are some.
made available on the internet. And it's the type of law that someone would either have to pay a commercial vendor to access or haul their cookies into a law library to get. That's it. Now let's not confuse this with open law. Open law is the ideal. Open law is a lot more technologically difficult to do. As we'll hear, Tom Bruce and his gang have been trying to work on this for 20 years, and they still are having difficulty getting open law. And if they can't do it in 20 years, make fully open all the entire corpus of American law, you and your law library, library are not going to do it in six months. So that's, the goal would be, and I would love to have all American law be open. We're not going to worry about that. We're talking free. The hope is, even if it's messy, even if it is not quite perfect, bit by bit, all of us in law, law schools will work together and we'll get some law on the internet. And that's just a good starting place. Because so much, especially, you know, I say as a librarian, but also, you know, there's a problem that perfect is the enemy to do it, that people worry about doing things exactly right, they don't even start. Don't worry about the getting it right, don't worry about getting it perfect, we're gonna start. Which is not to say there aren't some best practices. Um, when Elmer and I were talking about this, he was saying, discuss what some best practices in law are. And I said, okay. And then I realized, I don't actually know what the best practices are. Um, and I don't want to make a list because people will find fault with it right now and I don't really want to get into an argument in the middle of my presentation. Um, but, so I also thought this would be a good opportunity for us as a community to come together and kind of, I can pitch, I have a wiki going, um, Charlotte Snyder in the back, she kind of co-manages it with me. It's a free law users group and I envision it very similar to like innovative users group. Um, and so, you know, it's wiki, there's a Google group, very inactive at this point in time, just because we're kind of getting started and I took um, spring off. And so, um, you know, maybe we can come up, you combine our brain power and come up with some best practices of how to publish free law on the web. So, I will shoot a link out about that eventually that we can, and by eventually, I mean when Elmer's talking, I'll do it, I'll put on the Twitter. Get on the Twitter so the kids can see it. And um, we can maybe start cracking on that. Okay. So why do free law? Big question. Okay, public service is a good reason. So if you are at a taxpayer supported institution, maybe you should do something for the people that are paying your bills. There's also a huge justice gap in the country. If you have not heard this fact yet, let me repeat it, tell it to you. Um, we exist right now in a world where 80% of the people who need legal representation of some sort or the other are unable to afford it. So if you're unable to afford an attorney, your only option is to help yourself, which you can do in the United States, but to help yourself, you need to have access to the law. If you can't have access to the law and you can't have access to an educated person such as an attorney to help you, you're doubly hosed. Um, law schools, and law libraries have kind of a surplus of legal knowledge and um, information skills, such as organization and um, metadata, and all these ways we know how information should, should be organized. So why don't we take this knowledge and apply it? Um, and also to alleviate law, li law library budget crunches. Now I'm not talking about your law library, which I know is also going through a budget crunch. I'm talking about the county law library, because if you think your budget's in trouble, I'm from Ohio originally, all of the county law libraries in Ohio have had their budgets decimated. And so now, in some cases, I used to work in Kentucky. In some cases, the county law library is literally a closet with 50-year-old books in it. Um, so there's a big need right there that you guys can step up, you know, help them. And also the law school crisis. And, anyone get a big one yet? For the member of the the law school crisis? Um, in theory, you can provide a value to the alumni. They might not have to pay for certain um, subscription services if you have well provided for them, as well as an opportunity, A, to get your students on the books as far as they're employed now, or some skills trained. Um, as what we heard in Henderson's talk and what Richard Susskind said, you know, these new career opportunities, these would be jobs that they could have after they graduate. This would be very much practical experience for them on the job of creating digital law. But really that's just something you tell your niece. <coughs> or your marketing department will put in a brochure in a few years and tell you tell the world how great your law school is. For the most part, free law is a labor of love. 
It is not anything you're going to make money off of. Most of the people in your law school aren't going to care. You're not going to get extra grants to do it. It's really going to be something that you're going to have to do on your free time, with time that you don't have now, with resources you don't have now. Just understand that it's not going to be something fun. There's no glory in it. It's really because it's something that you want to do. And no slides is ever going to convince you to do free law. Either you want to do it or you don't. You're here, so I assume you kind of have some interest in it. So thank you for that. But otherwise, it's kind of a thankless job. So how can I do this? That, that sounds great, Sarah. Let me get into this game. I want to do free law. It sounds totally miserable. OK, here we go. You can do free law five easy steps. Um, Sorry for the last 20 years of your life you've wasted, huh? <laughs> <laughs> sir, sir, I'm all ears. <laughs> okay, first step, pick a jurisdiction. Um, seems kind of obvious. And once again, being overachievers like you probably are, you're going to say, I'm going to get all of the law in my state online. Don't, don't dream that big. Let's, let's crush those dreams. Let's get them down to something manageable. Maybe you just want to do your local district court. And I'm talking to you like the 2nd District of Ohio. Think, dream small. Dream small. Um, so, yeah, don't do your whole state. Certainly don't think the whole world. Maybe think just your county. If you're you like somewhere in Chicago, maybe your municipal code has just been made available so by a certain someone. That might be something you can work with and try to get online. Pick a type of law. Again, I used to tell my one else, there are three types of law generally in the United States. Legislative information, court information, and administrative information. Pick one, put it up there, you know. Think about that, what kind of law you want to get. So again, you don't have to get every type of law. It can be very, very narrow in scope. Find a source. This is, so you, you've all flown, I'm sure, and you know when they're doing the big spiel, look for the nearest exit. And remember, the exit might be behind you. Remember, your, your source might not be just a website that's already put up crappily by the government. Your source might actually be a person. Um, depending on where you are, you would be surprised. I mean, a lot of civil servants, bless their hearts, they mean well, but they're not maybe educated in the way the law works or what is available. You'd be surprised, you just give them a call and say, hey, are you getting all the briefs from, you know, the Supreme Court? We maybe have a copy. You used to send us a print copy, or you're, you are sending us a print copy. Would you mind if we scan those and digitize them and put them up on the web? You'd be surprised what you can do with just asking a simple question. Choose your distribution format. Um, the more is better, just like kitty cats. And so you can do just a PDF. You can do an HTML, and there are all different types of formats, depending on how much time you have, what your personal technological skills are. So you can do, you know, think HTML, think XML, you could do EPUBs, you could do PDFs, you could do Word documents. But don't feel like you can only do one. You can do many different types. And then your mechanism. This is one of the ways Cali can help you. If you want to have a website, but you don't have admin privileges on your school's library website, you can set up a Classcaster site, which is based on WordPress. Use that. You can use your library website. Do you want to have a special URL, like indianalaw.org? Do you want to have it a special website within your law school's website? Something like that. So obviously somewhere on the web, but then also, depending on what your um, technological skill is, is it going to have an RSS feed? Is it going to have an API. You can really make this as complicated or as simple as you want. But even if you want to set up a WordPress site on Classcaster and post PDFs, that's great. So congratulations! Five steps and you're now a free law distributor. Yay! Um, but wait, how much is this going to cost? Because money don't grow on trees. Um, and actually, the nice thing about law, most of the time, it is free, that you can get you know, the, your court or your local jurisdiction will probably have a really terrible version on their website. And you can scrape that for free or even download it for free. Um, but the, the main time sink, the main cost is going to be time of your staff. And again, that's not an inconse inconsequential cost, but um, 
I went to Dean Jorgensen's talk the other day, and he said it only took like three weeks to do your um, in New Jersey statutes initially, and then about yep. five minutes a day. So yeah, and that's and this side is super complicated. But the thing is, like just with the money, this is something you're going to have to decide to do. At the end of the day, think: Does the world need another lit guide on how to research federal law, or do I want to take that time and maybe work on this free law project? It's really just a personal choice you're going to have to make. Either you're in it or you're not. And if you're in it, choose to spend your time doing this. So, prepare to be inspired. This is just a collection of laws, current, schools currently doing free law, in a whole manner of ways. So the first one, um, this is Northern Kentucky University, and what they have done, and I don't know if we ever spoken about this, because I've heard you speak about this at a row. Um, and what they're doing is digitizing briefs from the Kentucky State Supreme Court as well as the Kentucky Court of Appeals. And this is one of those instances that started with a phone call. They said, you're sending those, these to us in print. You might have to put them online. And they scan them, but then they also have law students providing some extra metadata. So it's improving upon, A, it's providing something that didn't exist before, briefs online. And it's improving upon it using the knowledge that we have floating around in law schools. Um, and also, and this kind of goes along with your pick a subject, pick a type of law, it doesn't have to be current law, because that's kind of hard actually in a way. Current law keeps changing, you have to keep updating it. Maybe you just want to do historic law. So this is University of Georgia, and what they did was scan in historic Georgia codes, and they're posting it on their B press install. So this is their scholarly repository. They're using that, that is perfectly cool and accept acceptable. Think about that. Even if you know, if you've worked a public service um, reference desk, old law is still very important for research purposes for the public as well as scholarly types. So this is an option for you. Rutgers, if you missed the talk yesterday, it's on YouTube. Um, but this is all about John Jorgensen's New Jersey statutes online. Well, this is his courts webpage. He also does courts. <laughs> he does it all. Yes. Is that an example of starting small? Or? <laughs> yeah, he's a bit of an overachiever, yeah. Web you later. scraping is Thank so you. much faster than digitization. So much faster. So much faster. <laughs> um, this is, is anyone here from Stanford? I see some Justinians here. Um, so this is a co-project between Stanford and Justia. And this is... What's <laughs> um, like SCOCAL? Uh, SCOCAL. Is this just Supreme Court of... Uh, yeah. California. Supreme Court of California, they're putting the cases online, but then they have their law students write annotations to it. So that's providing a little bit of um, secondary uh, material for the general public to use and get a great benefit out of. Uh, Security Lawyer's Desk Book. This is, I don't have a URL for this because it's currently under construction and it's now, this was done by the University of Cincinnati for a long time. Um, so again, also when I was, you know, pick a type of law, it could also be you pick a subject. So if your school has a large environmental law um, practice group, maybe you do a collection of just environmental regulations, environmental statutes, put those online, maintain them. If you look at the Cali E. Lake Bell page, we kind of did something like that with the um, intellectual property law. We, what I did, I went to Fedsys. I just scraped all of the, um, the code sections that dealt with patents, trademarks, and the other type of intellectual property law. I was hoping the third one would come to me by the time I got to it. But anyway, go to Ealing Go. Um, and we just put them into EPUBs. And so that's just another way of making it easier for the general public to access primary law. And what they've done here is security law. And they're, has Sarah talked about this yet with Ken? Is that tomorrow? No, it was uh, yesterday. Oh, okay. Well, that will also be on YouTube. So it's a, it's now going to be a joint LII University of Cincinnati program. Uh, another, uh, this is Loyola, New Orleans. They have, this is their law and technology clinic. And they actually have a couple of apps. So again, you can also think of apps as being a way of free law, but that's really complicated. So we're not gonna think about that. That's a big plan. That's a Daniel Burnham plan. But what they have is the LA Crim, Crim Book, the Louisiana criminal law. Um, and this aims to replace West's big and expensive handbook of criminal law with a free digital alternative. And one of our friends from West is here, so it's Hi. So this is um, replacing one of uh, West products, and it's an HTML5 app. But you could just even take all the criminal laws in your jurisdiction, put them up on the web, make them easier to find for um, the public. 
and the granddaddy of all free law projects of a law school, the Legal Information Institute, and we'll hear about some of its founding at the end of the program. <coughs> and now Elmer will talk about some technological details. And stuff. And So I decided, nah, I don't need a title anyway. Yeah, everybody gets it. So you can, you can email me. Um, also, these slides, along with some notes, are also on the session description. So if you want to follow along, all the links are there and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm probably going to hit uh, some of the same spots as, as Sarah, but in, in, with, with just regular fonts. So, so, so when I when I reread the session description this morning and realized that my slides had gone askew from what I had actually promised to talk about, um, the that happens, right? It's like mission drift, um, except it's presentation drift. So, so I thought I'd, I'd go and dig up a, a little bit of history about um, uh, law schools in in, uh, in in the free law uh, free law stuff. Um, is anybody uh, anybody in the room was uh, working in, in law schools in the uh, 94 to 98 range? Yes, yeah, so some of you. Crown Jewel. Well, yeah, when, when you went there right after high school, sure. But <laughs> <laughs> right, everybody asked Tom Ryan how old he was at his first Cali conference. Okay, well, so. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, so, so, so once upon a time, um, the, uh, things, were, uh, things, were, things were a little bit different. So, so this, is, uh, this is Emory's uh, website. Um, from uh, October of 1997, uh, which was a long time ago, um, and a real long time ago in the internet years. The internet's been through, what, two, three bust and boom cycles and, and a whole bunch of stuff, and a lot of stuff has changed. <laughs> But at this point in time, Emory ran uh, the Federal Courts Finder, and it was a map, and it, and again, you could get to you could get to uh, to different uh, <coughs> circuits um, from here. But the, one of the really interesting things about this is is that if you start if you start following the links, which I, I just I just won't do because as Sarah noted before, it makes me mad. Um, you can see that a number of law schools were collecting and archiving um, Federal Circuit Court opinions. Right. So, um, and most of them did it 
Um, Emory's archives ran from, uh, they started in the 94, 95, they went back to the 94, 95 range and uh, finally uh, uh, died out in the early 2000s. Um, but a lot of the other, a lot of the other schools um, just collected them for four or five years, usually in the late 90s. Um, but the thing is, is that they're all gone, like literally, like not there. I mean, they're just vanished. The only one that's actually still alive that I found today, which totally surprised me, um, was uh, was Villanova, who is still collecting archives. So he's already, you could add this to your free law in uh, law schools less, right? It's not, and then somebody looked at this and they said, that's ugly. I'm like, well, yeah, that's not the prettiest website in the world, but the thing is, it is totally functional, though. Um, but they've got, they've got archives going back to 94, all the way through May of this year. So it's, it's totally up to date. Um, and you'll notice that they do, uh, they do let us know that the Villanova Law Library is the official archive for the opinions of the Third Circuit. The Third Circuit, by the way, like all the other circuits now, have has you know, has their own website. Um, but um, but it's neat that they're still collecting these things after all this time. Then there's nobody. Is there anybody from going over here? I worked on that site when I was there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and I, I actually uh, uh, did more than my fair share to shut Emory's down, but. <laughs> in fairness, in fairness if, I, if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done that. No, um, but um, but but I never expected the archive to go totally away, that, which which subsequently happened with sort of you know, but, uh, uh, and things things changed. So um, so so these were the schools, right? In Georgetown, Toro, Pace, Kent collected them for a while. Go ask John Muir about that. Um, the uh, 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 Washington, St. Louis, Washburn, for a number of years, Washburn ran, ran, ran a great site and a lot of stuff, and most of it seems to have disappeared. And of course, uh, LII Cornell, which apparently is still going. I don't know. I don't know. It's, a <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a rumor. It's out there somewhere. Um, so, so, so what happened to all that stuff, right? I mean, it just sort of disappeared. And, and, and new projects have started since then, right? Which, you know, Harry, you know Sarah uh, highlighted some of those, um, you know, where, where libraries are collecting different things, um, like briefs and, and opinions and stuff, and, and that's great. But, but how do we know those won't disappear? Um, because one of the things, um, um, one of the things that, that, um, that I know happened from just personal experience, was it was a simple a matter of personnel, a personnel change, right? Somebody leaves the school. Um, they're responsible for that particular project. The servers get unplugged and stashed in the closet, and then later sold for scrap. Nobody bothered to take any of the data off, right? It's like, ah, oh, that was his project, he's gone now. Off the way to the server. And that's what happened. I mean, it was just like that. Um, you know, and, and that isn't exactly what happened at Emory, but it was, you know, it was, it was kind of close. But, the, um, you know, and, and I actually uh, made a copy, and I can't find my copy of Emory's archive. Either, so. But I do have the programs that converted the old WordPerfect files into HTML. I, I've managed to hang on to those. But, but what they were doing at the time, uh, at the beginning of this, and then. Uh, they were dialing into, they, um, these law schools had, a lot of them had special PACER accounts, or the, the predecessor to PACER. And they dialed in every night and downloaded WordPerfect files, because that's what everybody worked in, and then those were com uh, converted um, you know, uh, to, to HTML and, and put up on websites. And everything was running on Linux, or not Linux, it was running on, on well, some of it was on Linux, some of it was on Unix. There really wasn't much, uh, sort of Windows server stuff going on at the time. Because that would have been NT, and everybody knows how exciting that was. But they, <laughs> um, so yeah, so these things like just disappeared. And, and that's the part that makes me mad, right? Because that, that's when sort of my inner librarian kicks in and, and says like, you know, they, they, they made all these things disappear. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, today, and, and, and I know a lot of places were like, well, it's expensive to maintain, we need hard drives, all that stuff. But like now, I actually have like 
way more than they ever collected on this USB key um, running on this little sub hundred dollar computer, which you know, we'll get to in a minute. But um, so you know that's the that's the that's the kind of part. And then and then it, that makes me you know comes to a question about you know because if I ask librarians this question, right? Collecting and archiving primary legal materials, especially for your jurisdiction, they go, sure, sounds like something we should do. Then when I ask them that question, then they start talking about how expensive hard drives are. Um, and you know, to me, it doesn't, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I think they should be you know, working on collecting like those schools that are already doing that sort of stuff. Do what Sarah said, follow those five easy steps. Because then that way, you know, you get, you know, like that after 20 years, you have more hair than Tom. And that's so true. <laughs> because if Tom had those five easy steps, he <laughs> <laughs> would have much more hair. Well, actually, the five easy steps were probably a lot of them were roughly the same steps. They were just a lot harder back then. <laughs> there were five really hard steps then. Now they've become a lot easier. Um, so, so, and now I'll get to, 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 the, uh, to, the, uh, to the technical part a little bit. So, right, because I, I was very excited because actually, I usually, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, and usually it would just use text, or I, I would just use a web page or something. But this time I even went, this is just stack clip art, though, before anybody gets excited. I didn't look that far. But I did type in, and I found a toolbox. Um, so, uh, with some tools, help. well, because in Cali, um, uh, I've actually built some stuff, right? That um, you know that, that that might help collect and and deal with, um, especially with case law, right? So, so I've got a couple of things. Um, the, the the first two are the first two are um, the first two are actually sort of floating around out there right now. The third one is just a really crazy idea, um, but. Uh, the third one's actually probably owned by Tom Ryan right now, unless he hasn't bothered to hack that pirate box. He's a kid. Um, Cork Cloud is a, it's a repository for, um, it's a repository for court opinions, right? So, um, so, I mean, you can think of it like Dropbox for courts. Right. So, so the idea would be that there's a secure place um, where uh, where 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 whoever's you know whoever's in charge of the opinions can put the opinions. So they have a they have a folder on their desktop. They save them into that folder. They get replicated to the court cloud server. The court cloud server takes the word processing files because that's what they're they're writing. In. They're, they're not creating the opinions in Adobe Acrobat. I know that because I've looked, and most of them are still using, everybody say it with me now, Word, Word Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> matter of fact, I think the only reason that that piece of software still exists, well, there's two, the federal court system and lawyers. There's still a lot of, a lot of law firms still use Word Perfect. Not so many, actually most, uh, it's been beaten out of most law professors, except the really stuff. Um, but anyway, they can put those uh, those word perfect files or, or whatever word processor they're using. They save them in the folder. They go securely to the server. We process them into uh, other formats, right? So we can we can convert them to HTML, to PDF, um, to XML. Um, we can gather them up into eBooks or whatever they'd like, and then we give them back a copy. But then we also put a copy in the free law reporter. Which then becomes available to everybody through search front ends and, and APIs. Um, the other thing that they get back, uh, besides getting back the, the processed files, which then get uh, will essentially magically appear in their in their folder when the process is done, not in real time, because who knows? Um, but you know, within a certain window. Um, and then they can put them up on their website, whatever they'd like to do. But also using the free law reporter um, interface, they could build 
uh, custom search engines to search just their logs in the free log recorder and that sort of stuff. But Cork Cloud can be used, the technology behind it, it's all open source. It's a package called OwnLaw. Um, and you could, or OwnLaw, own Cloud, excuse me. It's all our own law, right? That's the problem. Um, own Cloud is the open source uh, package uh, that, that allows that allows for, for sort of the magic to happen. And, um, and that can actually be used by, you know, we could set, um, you know, we're doing experiments with, <laughs> there's somewhere looking out there at Cali Cloud. Um, but, <laughs> so watch out. Um, but the, uh, uh, not an official Cali product. Um, the, uh, but, but they could be used, law schools could, for example, if they were collecting uh, materials, they could do something like that as a way to either work with the courts or, or other, other uh, bodies to gather the material, or, you know, they could, you know, they could, they could use it themselves as, as part of, you know, they could actually use something like court cloud themselves, so that would be, uh, that would be one thing. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, the free law recorder. Um, which is already floating around out there, um, which I occasionally feed these days, although it's hard to get, it's hard to get case law anymore, because I've kind of eaten all I could find. Um, at least the stuff that's, has, I don't, I don't add things that have simply been scraped from PDF into the free law report. I only like nice HTML or XML documents, and that's all there is to it. So it's smaller than it could be because there's a lot of stuff sort of floating around up there that's been scraped out of PDFs. But you know, has anybody ever tried to extract text from PDF? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you know how that works, right? It's fun. It is fun. <laughs> and take a look at the latest uh, release of the Georgia Code. Um, so, um, so, so the free law reporter is uh, available, and the, the 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 technology that powers the free law reporter is all open source, and um, large chunks of the sort of glue and stuff that I use are actually on GitHub, so you can actually find the code that sort of runs behind the free law reporter. You can build your own, uh, it doesn't even take much. You could run, actually this whole thing runs on one small Amazon instance, um, which um, if you tweak it properly would hardly cost $20, $30 some money in that sort of space. Um, and um, so it's not even, you know, it's not even, uh, it's not even really expensive to sort of maintain. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, and so there's that. And then the other thing is um, <laughs> hack the law, the pirate box. A pirate box is a, um, uh, I, uh, is a, a pirate box is, a, is an idea um, that came out of, I think the Netherlands uh, uh, that, that, that the Dutch came up with, because what they wanted to do is they wanted to create a, 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 an access point with storage on it that they could just sort of pop up in a cafe and people could swap files. It doesn't log anything. There's no security. It's just for the exchange of files. Okay. So um, and so and so that's what uh, that's what hacked the law is that's what's running over here. Um, you know, if you pop open your, your wireless uh, browser, you should see half the law. If you connect to it, it will disconnect your other wireless network in, in, uh, in Windows or, or on the Mac. And then when you, when you open a browser, it'll automatically take you to a page where you can click on some stuff and there's, you know, there's, there, are, um, there are things going on there. But, but the idea is, is that you've got a wireless access point that has data on it that you can share with people, right? So, um, you know, and the, uh, and the total cost, that's a, that's a sub, sub $100 ancient uh, uh, Asus uh, triple E. I think you can actually get them on eBay now for about 40 bucks. Um, and, and, all the, uh, and all the stuff is on, um, runs on a, on an SD card, all the data is on the USB key. I, ironically enough, the free law reporter from a few years back, um, uh, USB key. But the thing is, is you can pack one of these up someplace and, and share stuff, right? So you could actually, use, you know, you could you could provide the law to patrons in your library. You could provide law to students in your class. 
Um, you could provide a lot of people in Starbucks. Maybe they need it. I don't know. Um, but there's a you know that sort of has an interesting um, you know an interesting sort of thing. Um, I'm also playing around, but did not bring with me a Raspberry Pi version of the whole thing, which then just gets smaller and, and less expensive and um, you know and uh, and way cooler because you can just put it in a little container and duct tape it up under your desk and, and forget about it um, and just just kind of let it go. Um, so that's uh, the the hack of all things. Anybody connecting to it? Yeah, nobody's great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you? You got into it? Yep. There you go. Um, well, actually, it's a little weird, like because like you get you get sort of there's like some kind of like weird thing in in my in my computer brain that like gets a little edgy when I'm connected to something connected to a network that's not connected to the internet, right? I mean, we've gotten so used to thinking of the net or a network as being the internet. And, and really, you know, there's there's actually a lot of use for networking things that aren't on the internet. I know that kind of sounds like heresy or something, but but it's true, right? I mean, you, you know, if you have a set of data that you want to share with a group of people that are in one place, and you know, and, and that's actually a good way to do it. And, and you don't want the distractions of the entire rating network, you know, you don't want you know, you don't want all of that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good thing because imagine if you know if you're teaching something and you load all of your stuff on something like this, and you have your students come in and they attach to this, they can't get to Facebook during class. They can't get to eBay during class. So I think that's like I'm drifting into another topic. So we'll just we'll go back to the slides. I'm almost done. So we get time to do this because. Um, well, it's actually, I've never really heard the story of how LLI got started myself. I don't know why not. I should. So, so I was gonna, I was gonna give you homework, which sort of goes with what Sarah was saying, right? So, you know, start a collection, right? Get a hard drive, you know, and and, and there you go. You know, hang. Does anybody actually have a desktop computer in their office still? Anybody? Yeah. See, there you go. It's always on the network, right? You leave it running all the time. Yep. Sure. Hey, go get a get a get a get an eighty nine dollar hard drive, USB hard drive, connect it up. You know, there you go. So, um, and then if there's any questions, well, can you take them out real quick, or things that you need. Anybody have any questions? Or do we want to hear about LIO? Okay, thanks. Where the trucker hat? Is that the one that you put in? That would cover up his trendy bangs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. Am I audible? No. No. Okay. 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 All right. Well, there we go. My green light just came on. One on the mic did too. Uh, so. This is, a, this is a little bit of a disorganized improvisation, but uh, I, I've been asked to say a little bit about how we got started and why. And, and I'd like to actually start by thanking Sarah for that uh, unique redaction of the Montreal Declaration, which I personally find to be one of the most obnoxiously pompous things that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, there are many, many reasons to do open access to law. Some of them are highly altruistic and use phrases like freedom and democracy, and some of them are very practical and use phrases like business facilitation and trade and the general opening up of economic life. Because, after all, what does it cost a business to find out what the regulation is? Actually, nobody really knows that. Uh, information discovery costs are typically assumed out of, of those kinds of studies, but we do know that there's a very big correlation in developing countries, for example, between the availability of government information in general and economic development. So, you know, I just toss that out there as one among many practical reasons uh, for doing this sort of thing. The other thing I sort of picked out of, out of, out of your thing, Sarah, that I, I wanted to mention is that there is no such thing as non glamorous sport. Uh, when we started out, and here comes the history, when we started out in 1992, we were focused on the Supreme Court because, in fact, there were electronic decisions available from the, from the Supremes at that point, and practically nobody else. 
they were distributing with an experimental version of what became Project Hermes. At that point, we were actually getting that data completely pre uh and redistributing it ourselves. It was not lost on us or on anyone else. Uh, the, the trend very early on was, was to start with high status courts. Let's put the Supreme Court out there because you know everybody cares about the Supreme Court. But you know, if you stop and think about it, what the Supreme Court does is in many ways a lot less important than what municipal courts do or county courts do and so forth. So I mean, the Supreme Court is about two guys suing two other guys, and you know they handle 75 cases a year. Uh, they have broad impact on American life, but the fact that they're way up there in the court food chain doesn't necessarily mean that they touch all that many people. So I, I guess, you know, to back up your point about start a collection, any collection, there are no unglamorous courts. And in fact, the further they are down in the, the sort of legal jurisdiction, the, the, the legal scholarship food chain, uh, the chances are the more important they are to a broad body of people, the harder their stuff is to get. Uh, remember that the law that is out there from commercial publishers is largely the law of deep pockets, uh, or at least primarily the law of deep pockets. And, you know, there's, there's other stuff you can love with them too. But let me go back and tell the story. Um, we started out in 1992 as a collaboration between a law school, a former law school dean and a slightly eccentric technologist who were actually fed up with the way that law schools were doing teaching technology and various other forms of technology on a number of levels and thought that it would be interesting to have some sort of vaguely speculative researchy home in which you could do interesting stuff and at the beginning we were as much concerned with putting stuff out on CD-ROM as we were with putting stuff out on the net. We started out actually doing statutory supplements uh, federal rules and, and that sort of thing on TV uh, and distributing those for, uh, for teaching. So at that point, the web was just starting to open up. We got interested in that. We put the first uh, Supreme Court decision ever into HTML. It was, uh, what is it, three pesos to be Taco Cabana? Is it uh, the Supreme Court's trade dress <laughs> case? Uh, first, one ever, first one ever on the web. Uh, and we had in mind several things in a vague kind of way that have hardened into to positions, you know, sort of institutional positions over the years. First of all, we were not in any way, shape, or form interested in becoming a comprehensive archive of American law. We are still not. Uh, I don't think that's possible in a single institution. Uh, I think we need to look at distributed approaches. Uh, but that's another matter for, for, for when we have more time. Uh, we, start, we concentrated instead on flagship collections for the Supremes because we could get the data. Uh, when we discovered that it was actually possible to buy a CD from uh, the government printing office and get the full text of the United States Code in plain text, we started doing the U.S. Code, uh, first with Title 17 in Gopher. It's a little bit other than myself. Uh, and moved that very quickly to HTML shortly thereafter. By 94, we had a full U.S. code, and by 2000, we had the first edition of the U.S. code in, in XML. The other thing that we didn't attempt to do, uh, for better or worse, was grant fund the thing. Uh, it is still the case, and I, I don't want to throw cold water on anybody here, it is, it is still the case, many years later, that there are very, very, very few organizations that make grant funding available for distributing free legal information. They're just not out there. Uh, and you know, there's this famous Thomas Nast cartoon, a New York political cartoonist from the uh, 1890s, who, who had this picture of the Tweed Ring, this ring of corrupt New York politicians, in which they're all standing in a circle with each guy pointing to the next one, saying he did it, right? Uh, the situation with funders for free legal information is that every, everyone's pointing at the next guy saying he should do it. Uh, the foundations believe the government should be doing it, the government believes the private sector should be doing it, the private sector believes the foundation should be doing it, so, so on and so on around the it's very, 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 very hard to find find some money there. Um, but I'm getting ahead. Why did we think it was a good read? Why did we think it was a good idea to do this specifically in a law school as opposed to some other kind of entity? The first thing was that we saw an awful lot of complementarity with things that law schools do well. There's a lot of expertise locked up in a faculty. There's a lot of expertise locked up in students of particular kinds. Uh, one of Peter's great adages is always the thing about getting good, good work out of law students is to give them the work that law students can do. Uh, and one of the things that a lot of students can do very well is assemble secondary sources of certain kinds. 
not deep analysis of the law necessarily, but things like resource pages, related case lists, and other kinds of very simple finding aids that can be built on top of it. So students are fantastic at that. It's a good working experience for them in many cases. We've gone on from that. And we, we have at the moment a, a, a publication that provides pre-analysis of upcoming Supreme Court cases. It's kind of the anti-SCOTUS plot where at the beginning of the process or at the end. Uh, that reaches now roughly 30,000 subscribers, uh, 16,000 of them by email, and 14,000 of them through print in the, uh, the, the magazine of the Federal Bar Association. Uh, and, and that's been a very, very good experience for students. Uh, there are research benefits to this to the faculty. Uh, we run, a, we've run for many years a, a very large U.S. code collection, which is widely used in Washington. Uh, and we found that that has actually opened the door in, in D.C. for a good many of our researchers and a good many of Cornell's researchers because there isn't anybody in a federal agency who doesn't think Cornell's doing them a favor. It's one of the benefits. That's where they all get their U.S. code. Uh, and researchers have come back to me on numerous occasions that, you know, we knock out the doors, they know who we are uh, because you guys are putting that stuff up. And, you know, it, it, it's very helpful. Uh, finally, the institutional exposure cannot be overstressed, at least in our case. So we receive, I don't know, I, I gotta ask this, and it, 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 it's, not an ex, it, it, it's not an effort to make anybody feel uncomfortable. I, I'm, I'm really curious because I don't know how many hits a law school website gets. I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna point at Paul Birch because I know he's been in the business a long time. So, so what's going on, Richard? I mean, how many hits I, you I have no idea anymore. It's so far away from um, the law school. Uh -huh. Uh, it's all locked up in the um, uh, university communications now. Uh -huh. who, who, who's got, who can volunteer a number? Anybody? I mean, I know for the law library page where I'm at, it was about 160 hits per day on the home page. Mm -hmm. And I could pull up Google Analytics. Yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, we're talking <laughs> it's in, the in communications as of two weeks ago, though. <laughs> we're talking in the hundreds and thousands. Uh, in the last <laughs> several days since June 5th, however long that is now, a week or a week or more. Uh, Ken Hirsch's security lawyer textbook at Cincinnati has sent us in excess of 7,000 visits mm -hmm. and approximately three pages per visit. Uh, that's what Ken's doing with the security lawyer's desk book. We do approximately 20 million unique visitors per year looking at over 100 visits. We account for 62% of Cornell's web traffic, and Cornell's webmaster has estimated that if we were to shut our servers off tomorrow, page rank on everything at Cornell uh, would drop between two and three points. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, when I was at when I was at Emory, um, the uh, the circuit court opinions that Emory held at the time that archive was drawing about. 100,000 page views a week. Um, the law school, uh, the law school part, when you, when you extracted just the, the court opinion stuff, I went to look at what the law school was doing. Not that big. Um, you know, the, the law school would typically do less than 10,000 page views a week, um, and some of that, the you know, was, was probably just carried over from the from the stuff. It, we, it certainly raised the, it raised the profile of the school quite a bit. We haven't done this in a while because, frankly, we've lacked the editorial hands to do it. I mean, we, 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 do about a, we, we own about a half a million pages, and we do this with a staff thing, uh, four of whom are, are, are technical people, and then there's me and a, a marketing communications guy who's administrative assistant who just hired a content development person who's, who's actually a, a former student on the keyboard, who I think is going to be quite fantastic. So we, we lack hands to do some of this. We want to go back and start connecting up faculty scholarship to uh, to secondary to secondary materials on the site again. It, back in the day, we, we did that for a while, and in the popular areas of scholarship, we have a death penalty project at Cornell, so, uh, and we've got scholars writing on death penalty topics. Their download rates uh, from our pages were approximately 700 times what they were from SSRA. Uh, so we see this as being a very high visibility forum for certain kinds of scholarship potentially. I mean, the finer points of security law are not going to pull that kind of traffic no matter where you publish it. Uh, but we do think we can be good institutional citizens in that way, and, and, and we, we want to 
to make some further efforts in that way. We, we've done that for other things within the university as well. Uh, so it's a, you know, for us it's a very bully pulpit, and I, I suspect, I, John, I don't know what your, oh, excuse me, Dean Jorgensen, I don't know what your experience has been uh, with the New Jersey stuff as, as, as a showcase for other things within Rutgers, but uh, I, I'm guessing that you get some benefit there. I was told by Mr. Ryan that for a year, well, I mean, when it was running steadily in Camden, it was the, the Lowell Library was the most consistently busy website in the university. And uh, when we moved a bulk of the collections up to Newark, we, we've taken a little hit on that, but it's coming back up. Now look, I, I want to sound a little bit of a note of caution here, and it's not meant to dampen anybody's enthusiasm. It's just meant to say, look, get, get, get ready for a ride here. Uh, because this kind of activity is not the sort of thing that law schools typically do well for a couple of reasons. Uh, I noticed that most of the resources out there are actually case law. Legislation is much harder for all the reasons that librarians know very well, which is that it changes frequently. It has to be updated. Somebody has to do that. Uh, there's great worry about whether, you know, how, how the point in time archives are preserved and so forth. It's not legislation is generally harder. And it brings up a couple of problems that, that law schools actually have. First of all, most programs in law schools uh, or most programs in law schools, I should say, that sit outside of libraries, which incidentally is a good argument for a library to be the place that you do this. Most programs that sit outside of libraries depend crucially on the support of someone on the tenure track. And the departure of that person, whether through retirement or a move to another institution, is enough to scale the whole thing. Uh, I got a very big education one day. I was, I was actually visiting somebody at NYU with a social visit. They, they had a copy of his phone directory. I guess it listed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little programs of one sort, you know, law and landscape or whatever. And uh, I said, well, Jesus, this is a lot of stuff. I mean, how many of these are real? And, and, and the answer was almost none. Uh, they were all programs that were still listed. They had all depended on the interest of some faculty member who had, who had vanished into the woods or whatever. I'm sure you've all had that experience at your own institution. The, the question then becomes, not just how do you do this, but how do you institutionalize it? And institutionalizing it inside a library is not necessarily a bad idea, because libraries can provide a kind of flywheel or continuity for this other kind of apparatus. Yeah, I don't know what your experience has been, Jerry. I know you've had some. Uh, I have. Uh, but um, my efforts were all outside the, the library environment. Mm -hmm. so, which puts you at the mercy of certain political forces, I imagine. Um, certainly has us. <laughs> yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, we're pretty, uh, it's just me and another guy, and uh, we were a whole bunch of operation, but uh, we managed with the help of uh, Fine Law. I mean, with Tim Stanley and Justin, for like 200 years of him, to, uh, to satisfy a pretty large uh, use of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking from what you're saying, Jerry, from what our experience has been, that there's kind of an ideal size, right? They're, they're, they're small enough to be under the radar and large enough to get the job done. And, uh, and, and you know, you, you, you make your way to that point somehow. But again, uh, getting programmatic continuity and, and getting sustainability, I, I, I think, is difficult. We looked around five or six years ago and looked at an awful lot of research work that was going on in Europe that we greatly admired. Uh, and had sort of made a start at a certain point. And we looked at the number of people we had available and turned the interesting work on and we thought, my God, we are going to spend the rest of our professional careers compiling the decisions of the United States Supreme Court and hoping that we can say, hey, no, we're not doing anything interesting here. We're just, we're, we're just dragging around a bunch of collections. And if we want to do any better than that, we're going to have to find some money. Uh, and our choice was to actually do that entrepreneurially because we'd already encountered the problem. That's when we began <coughs> advertising, which now accounts for approximately a quarter of our budget. Uh, we had done fundraising through private philanthropy for years. That accounts for another little bit. But yeah, right now we're still 40% on corporate folks. Uh, I would like to be off them entirely. I think we're going to be able to do that by the end of, uh, of, of the of FY15. Uh, but again, it's been, it, it's been something to struggle. And you know, say what you will about advertising on the site. We're not entirely pleased. About it, but on the other hand, that's how we can get it done. Uh, and so I would encourage everybody to use as much ingenuity as possible in coming up with funding streams for this 
stuff because, uh, you know, cheap to start, expensive to maintain uh, in the long run. Maybe not that expensive, depending on how big a collection you're doing. And, and again, I don't want you to take any of this as, as being discouraging. I think everybody has opportunities in this respect, and I think you can take advantage of them. And the more outreach you can be seen to be doing for the, for the institution, the better. I'm going to stop there because we're, 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 we're out of time. I could ramble on forever, as you can probably detect. But, but uh, the questions? There are two minutes of questions. Yes, sir. Anybody? Yes, Sarah. She's 19. She's nicer than me. <laughs> she is. <laughs> I have a question. Why are you 19? Because I'm 19. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Why are you 19? It's just out of permanent sugar. Yeah. <laughs> when are you 30? I'm sure I could look this up, but to fill up the two minutes, uh, uh, what, uh, could, you, could either of you talk a little bit more about the difference between open law and free law? I don't quite get the, get the distinction. You know, it, it's a it's a it, it's a particular thing with me. Uh, and it's a marketing thing. Uh, I would like people to look a little more deeply at what we're doing than simply the fact that they don't have to pay for it. Which is why I vastly prefer open to free. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've, made, I've brought generations of marketers to tears by refusing to let them use the word free. <laughs> because I'm thinking, you know, if all we have to offer is the fact that we're giving the stuff away, uh, then that sort of invites people to say, well, you get what you pay for. Exactly. I mean, that's what I say. I don't like the term free because I think, um, as someone I knew once said, people, if you give it away for free, they don't think it's worth anything. So there's a lot of uh, assumptions about the quality of free law. Um, but what I use free and open to mean differently is that open is, it's open. It's able, like, there's a lot of technological specifications to it. So, and also, so it's not copyrighted, there's no any issues, IP issues whatsoever. It's published in a format such as, the difference is, okay, um, to go back to last year's theme, free law is I give you a Lego minifig. Open law is I present you with five boxes of minifig parts and you're able to go through and pick a head, pick a torso, pick legs, pick a hat, and pick a sway. So you can have you know Lego man riding a horse, or you can have a fireman, so basically, you can make whatever you want out of it. It gives you, open law is a raw material that you can manipulate any way you want. Cut it up, mix it around, put it into any form. Free law is a static thing that you can just, it's just a main, mainly an economic thing. It's only because you, you're just not paying for it. That's the difference between the two. There's and see, 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 I see it as free as in freedom, right? Because that's what it's supposed to be. Okay, and, and I know. Yeah. It's like, the, the whole free, free Libre thing that gets <laughs> free the, the butt of English language. Right, bird. but not free yeah, as yeah. in puppy. <laughs> free as in bird. Just as an illustration, <laughs> um, so the LexisNexis version of the Georgia Code is free, yeah. but not open. Right. Right. You can go to the web and surf it for free, but you can't take a copy of it. Right. And actually, yeah. you're bringing me back to a point that I wanted to make early on, and absolutely failed to do. I mean, in, in some ways, if you were to look at me and say, well, what, what is the most important thing that you guys have done? Uh, I would not say that it was putting up any particular set of statutes or judicial opinions openly for the public at no cost. I would say that the most important thing that we've done, with all due respect to those in the room, is to break the stand stranglehold that the commercial publishers had, not just on publication, but on the whole notion of how access to law was done. When I came into this business in the late 80s, you got on the screen what Les told you you got on the screen was their user interfaces, their intellectual approaches, their form of organization. What we've done is make it possible for people to take that stuff and shape it in whatever way they want to in ways that are profoundly more innovative than Ingles, any single commercial entity can do. I have a lot of respect for Les, as you know. Uh, but they don't know everything. Uh, and putting the stuff out where smart people can work with it, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. And actually, Wes has done it. And now we got to move down. Yep, we do. <laughs> <laughs>